Welcome everybody back to the Founded on Christ podcast. This is Curtis here with you, another fellow disciple of Christ, striving to do what it is the Lord wants me to do. And I am here with my wife, Amanda. Hello. And with my sister-in-law, Colleen. Hi. Voices you may be familiar with. If you've been listening to the channel for a while, if not, go back, you'll find them there. <laughs> yep, we're there. Yep. So today, we're kind of doing a, a part two to the marriage as God intends, as the podcast we did a little while back, but we're also, it's going to be a little bit focused on Joseph and his character and, and some of the things that we have discovered as we have looked into church history into joseph's history uh last time was it was more of a uh a scriptural analysis striving to see what god had to say on the matter now in this attempt is going to be a little bit more about uh the his historicity of of marriage and how it worked it with joseph throughout his tenure as a prophet until his death and so with that i'm going to toss the talking stick, preferably, over to Colleen to get us started, as I usually do. Well, I don't know where to start, <laughs> <laughs> because we have Amanda, who's going to be reading stuff, but <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, we just wanted to kind of go back and do a little bit more of kind of defending Joseph and Emma and their character. Because it seemed like a lot of time after their death, well, after Joseph's death, um, they were kind of scapegoats um, with this whole polygamy thing. And so we kind of just wanted to um, go in and try and shine a different light and kind of bring Joseph and Emma's true character character yeah true character out and hopefully it can help others do a little bit more research and and maybe find their way if they're struggling with um if joseph was a polygamist or not or if he was a true prophet or not yeah. um so anyway we wanted to start with um joseph smith you know, and maybe I'll just add a little something in there before we really get going. Okay. Um, it's going to be impossible to prove 100% conclusively either way yeah. that Joseph was or wasn't a polygamist. And we're going to bring up, I think, several good reasons why that is hard to understand at this point. But I just wanted to put that out there that we'll, we'll probably never really get the full answer to this until we're on the other side or unless someone comes up with some new historical find of some sort but the waters are extremely muddy uh depending on where you look <laughs> and so i don't i don't think anyone should feel threatened this is more or less a a giving of information yeah so that you have more to consider as you move forward i hopefully no one feels threatened by this it's just the the opportunity to hear more and use that in your decision making exactly yeah agreed okay. so anyway we wanted to start with joseph smith's first vision um i know that there's a lot of people that have a problem with that just because there's so many different accounts mm -hmm. um but we wanted to go into his first edition um and written by himself yeah written by him um it and might be a little bit different than what most of us have, have heard real you know heard growing up <laughs> yeah <laughs> but church, this was yeah. it, as far as we can tell this was written by him in his own hand about the experience yes so we'll have amanda read that it might be a little long but it's interesting and it's got a lot of information in it that kind of helps us lead to where we're going okay i'm starting a little ways into it it says 
I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else to whom I could go and obtain mercy. And the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness. And while in the attitude of calling upon the Lord in the sixteenth year of my age, a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun at noonday come down from above and rested upon me, and I was filled with the Spirit of God. And the Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord, and he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Behold, the world lieth in sin at this time, and none doeth good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel, and keep not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips, while the hearts are far from me, and mine anger is kindling against the inhabitants of the earth to visit them according to their ungodliness, and to bring to pass that which hath been spoken by the mouth of the prophets and apostles. Behold, and lo, I come quickly as it is, written of me in the cloud, clothed in the glory of my Father, and my soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy, and the Lord was with me. But I could find none that would believe the heavenly vision. Nevertheless, I pondered these things in my heart. But after many days I fell into transgression and sinned, in many things which brought a wound upon my soul and there were many things which transpired that cannot be written and my father's family have suffered many persecutions and afflictions and it came to pass when i was 17 years of age i called again upon the lord and he shewed me shewed unto me a heavenly vision for behold an angel of the lord came and stood before me, and it was by night, and he called me by name, and he said, The Lord had forgiven me my sins. And he revealed unto me that in the town of Manchester there were there was plates of gold upon which there was engravings, which was engraven by Moroni and his fathers and servants of the living God, in ancient days, and deposited by the commandments of God, and kept by the power thereof, and that I should go and get them. And he revealed unto me many things concerning the inhabitants of the earth, which since have been revealed in commandments and revelations. And it was on the 22nd day of September, 1822, and thus he appeared unto me three times in one night, and once on the next day. And then I immediately went to the place and found where the plate was deposited as the angel of the Lord had commanded me and straightway made three attempts to get them. And then being exceedingly frightened, I supposed it had been a dream, a vision. But when I considered, I knew that it was not Therefore I cried unto the Lord in the agony of my soul, Why can I not obtain them? Behold, the angel appeared unto me again, and said unto me, You have not kept the commandments of the Lord, which I gave unto you. Therefore you cannot now obtain them, for, this, for the time is not yet fulfilled. Therefore thou wast left unto temptation, that thou mightest be made acquainted with the power of the adversary. Therefore repent, and call on the Lord. Thou shalt be forgiven, and in his own due time thou shalt obtain them. For now I have been tempted of the adversary, and sought the plates to obtain riches, 
and kept not the commandment that I should have an eye single to the glory of God. Therefore I was chastened and sought diligently and obtained the plates and sought diligently to obtain the plates and obtained them not until I was 21 years of age. And in this year I was married to Emma Hale, daughter of Isaac Hale. We'll stop there. Okay. Um, this account, his account, mm -hmm. was found in the first edition of the Joseph Smith papers. The papers of Joseph Smith, volume Which, one. Yeah. So if you want to go and read it, it's in that book. How easy is it for you to go find? <laughs> You found it on Amazon pretty cheap, I think. Yeah, I got it at a thrift store online. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't hard to find. And this is the 1989 edition. Yeah. Which now the newer edition doesn't have this account. Yeah, it's different in the new version of the Joseph Smith Papers. Right? Yeah, it's the church's version of the history, not his Actual own account. words. Yeah. Which, by the way, was really hard to read with all of the misspellings and no punctuation. <laughs> There's no punctuation at all. Nope. <laughs> well, you did pretty good. It's more authentic that way. <laughs> I'm getting confused. Yeah. But anyway, in the one that we know that's in the Book of Mormon, it doesn't give you why... He couldn't get them. He couldn't get the plates. It just says he had to wait until he was older... It didn't say it was because he was sinning and yeah, and he wanted to needed to yeah. repent and yeah, he needed to change his heart a little bit. There's there's a lot more detail in that, and there's a lot more of showing Joseph as a human, mm -hmm. yeah. but with with faults, with things that needed to be fixed in order for it, that he needed to change in order so that he could come in harmony with God enough that he would be trustworthy to hold the plates and perform the work that was there before him. And yeah. it's, yeah, it, I, I think it, it helps build out the character of Joseph much more than, you know, the little bit of the shinier version that we have in the, in the scriptures right now in the standard works. Yeah. Um, now in the um, first edition of the Book of Mormon, there's a little quote that um, I liked it. I read it and I'm like, oh, we need to share that. And let me see if I can find it. It says, written and sealed up and hid up unto the Lord that they might not be destroyed to come forth by the gift and power of God unto the interpretation thereof sealed by the hand of Moroni, and hid up unto the Lord, to come forth in due time by the way of Gentile, the interpretation thereof by the gift of God, an abridgment taken from the book of Ether, also which is a record of the people of Jared, which were scattered at the time the Lord confounded the language of the people when they were building a tower to get to heaven, which is to shew unto the remnant of the house of Israel how great things the Lord how great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, and that they may know the covenants of the Lord, that they are not cast off forever, and also to the convincing of the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. And now, if there be fault, it be the mistake of men. Wherefore, condemn not the things of God, that ye may be found spotless at the judgment seat of Christ. And then it just says, by Joseph Smith Jr., author and proprietor. And I thought that kind of went well with um, Joseph's account, because he's human. he is human. He's mm -hmm. a man. Yeah. So, and, you know, we see it not just with Joseph, but other people. Um, the temptations come, and 
there's also um, things that they could probably receive from the adversary instead of the Lord at times. You know, they're, they're men. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, we kind of wanted to talk about um, some of the revisions that have been made to histories specifically joseph smith's <laughs> yeah yeah to explain why there is there's this confusion for some people it's pretty black and white why there's this confusion about polygamy in the church it probably helps to get a little bit of background about what was going on with joseph's records <laughs> and so this is specific specifically uh certain people in their own journals recording what was going on with Joseph Smith's records after he died. Yeah. And we've got a quote from Brigham Young's um, journal, I think, mm -hmm. where he talks about he was revising some of Joseph's history. Yeah. Yeah, this one was April 1st, 1845, nine months after the martyrdom. And you can find it in the History of the Church, Volume 7, page 389. And at Brigham Young writes, I commenced revising the history of Joseph Smith at Brother Richard's office. Elder Heber C. Kimball and George A. Smith were with me. And then, let's see, Enos Smith in the biography of Charles Wesley w Wandel which can be found in the Journal of History 3, says, I noticed the interpolations because having been employed in the historian's office at Nauvoo by Dr. Richards and employed too in 1845 in compiling this very autobiography, I know that after Joseph's death, his memoir was doctored to suit the new order of things and this too by the direct order of brigham young to dr richards and systematically by richards and then this one says moreover since the death of the prophet joseph the history has been carefully revised under the strict inspection of president brigham young and approved by him so, what I want to say is why? Yeah, what's the and, point? Yeah, why is someone revising somebody else's history? Like, why would you go back? And there's even um, the Joseph Smith history given by his mother, Lucy Mac Smith, mm -hmm. where it had started making its rounds and... Brigham had said, like, do not read it. He even, like, burned all the books or something like that. And um, and he's like, nobody's to read this until I revise it. Why does it need to be revised? It's not his history and his truth. And just like that said, that Inez Smith, he said that... he was going to doctor it to suit the new order of things. Yeah. Well, what's the new order of things? What's he revising it yeah. to? And make just, it? and to say this for everybody out there, who's having these thoughts that there, and when I read that, there's a red flag that goes up because for me, there is a difference between editing, like, yeah. like shortening or pulling clips or whatever, you know, to, for some sort of purpose of releasing to the public for me, there's a difference between editing and revisioning. revising. Yeah, yeah re revising. Sorry, not revisioning. <laughs> <laughs> revising the records. That indicates some sort of amount of going in and changing things. And especially when it is somebody who holds so much clout with the people that Brigham was over, it causes you to at least pause and think about what was the purpose? Why would he need to do that? And... And what was the goal of that in mind? Yeah. 
All right. Now that we're done with that, <laughs> <laughs> um, we wanted to just kind of go through some people's um, own words. First-hand accounts. Like, yeah, first-hand accounts. Not From Joseph and not Hiram and Emma. Second, third, fourth, fifth accounts. That are not reliable. <laughs> yeah. Um, 30 years after the fact. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got Joseph Smith refers people to extract from Doctrine and Covenants on marriage, which disavows polygamy, stating that this is the only rule allowed by the church. And if you remember, um, that's in Doctrine and Covenants, the 1835 version that I read that thing from. Um, and it states, Inasmuch as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband, except in the case of death, when either is at liberty to marry again. Yep. And then, um, and that other thing that I just read, it's from the Times and Seasons, volume three, page 909, and that was in 1842. Um, and then the next one, Joseph Smith repeats again, statement from Doctrine and Covenants, on marriage to deny all allegations of polygamy, polygamy being practice and that's times and seasons volume three page 939 and in 1842 and then joseph and hiram smith announced the excommunication of hiram brown a member of the church for preaching polygamy and other false and corrupt doctrines in the county of lapeer state of michigan and that was in Times and Seasons, Volume 5, page 423. And that was in 1844. And then Hiram Smith, with full knowledge and consent of his brother Joseph, publishes statement, publishes statement categorically denying any teaching of plural wives or polygamy, and that all such teachings is false doctrine. And then quoting it, it says, Some of you, your elders say, that a man having a certain priesthood may have as many wives as he pleases, and that doctrine is taught here. I say unto you that the man, that, that man teaches false doctrine, for there is no such doctrine taught here, neither is there any such thing practiced here. And that is the Times and Seasons, Volume 5, page 474, and that was in March of 1844. And then there's a statement denouncing teaching of plural wives as fiendish, states that the spiritual wife system merely allows a man to be married to another wife for time and eternity if his first wife dies. And that's Times and Seasons, volume 5, page 715, and also in 1844. So that's just some of the things that came from Joseph and when he was around before he he and Hiram were martyred. Yeah. The, the things that are the most public the, and the least subject to change on a whim are of that nature. There is a lot of Hiram and Joseph uh, speaking out against the practice. We have Doctrine, the original Doctrine and Covenants 101 that was removed when 132 was put in. All these things where Joseph and Hiram are, and Emma, uh, in some instances when you find it, are very outspoken about the fact that polygamy or spiritual wifery, which those things really are the same thing. Some people like to make the, the case that they're not, but they really are the same thing, yeah. that it was denounced by the church. And to go as far as they would persecute, well, persecute, they would prosecute and excommunicate people who were living it and say that it was a false doctrine. I know a lot of people will go along the path of saying, well, 
it was something the Lord had commanded, but because it wasn't allowed in you know the area at the time, they had to lie about it. They had to give a false pretense, which is almost understandable, but it doesn't make sense for them to outright go the other direction, to call it out as a false doctrine, to uh, be so adamant and crazy in the other direction if they believe that it was a true doctrinal uh, principle to live at some point. They would not want to adhere the entire church to a different way of believing, which they would then have to correct later. It wouldn't make any sense to me. And so these things, which, you know, when you go looking, you can find them quite readily where they're very outspoken, to me, says loads about where they, what they were actually doing in their own life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else before we move on to Emma? I know there was a quote by Catherine, Joseph's sister, about the last conference before he died, but I can't find it. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about, but yeah, I can't quote it. Yeah. <laughs> from memory but the one that basically uh the people that sat in the conference were the same ones that plotted his death mm -hmm. yeah yeah all right um next we wanted to kind of go into emma and brigham's relationship <laughs> <laughs> which is that interesting yeah <laughs> yeah obviously if anyone's They're at all funny. familiar with church history they did not get along if you're like me uh you had this somewhat uh air that emma though she had been really righteous and loyal to joseph after his martyrdom she somehow lost her faith and you know left the church that's you know seems to be the extent yeah of like what growing most of us up know. that was that was what we knew it's and so you kind of put her on the back burner you know yeah. like oh well, i don't have to, to yeah yeah i don't have to really pay attention you yeah. know to that because that was she gets shuffled off to the backstage yeah <laughs> <the history. laughs> yeah but anyway we have that um october general conference in 1866 where brigham <laughs> talks not so great about emma yeah nope. um so we wanted to uh read through that and talk about it for a second but he starts to my certain knowledge emma smith is one of the damnedest liars i know of on this earth yet there is no good thing i would refuse to do for her if she would only be a righteous woman, but she will continue in her wickedness. Not six months before the death of Joseph, he called his wife Emma into a secret council, and there he told her the truth and called upon her to deny, deny it if she could. He told her that the judgments of God would come upon her forthwith if she did not repent. He told her of the time she undertook to poison him and he told her that she was a child of hell and literally the most wicked woman on the earth that there was not one more wicked than she he told her where she got the poison and how she put it in a cup of coffee said he you got that poison from so and so and i drank it but you could not kill me when it entered his stomach he went to the door and threw it off he spoke to her in that council in a very severe manner, and she never said one word in reply. I have witnesses of this scene all around who can testify that I am now telling the truth. Twice she undertook to kill him. Yeah. Now read the <laughs> Bushman. Thing. Now there was um, a guy called Richard Bushman who actually was around when that supposed Event. poisoning happened. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to read that. He says, Through the late fall and winter of 1843 and 1844, Joseph and Emma's relationship broke down only once, 
During Sunday dinner on November 5th, Joseph became ill, rushed to the door, and vomited so violently that he dislocated his jaw. Every symptom, every symptom of poison, Richards noted in Joseph's diary. That day, that night at the prayer meeting, Richard wrote in, in code that Joseph and Emma did not dress in the usual special clothing, a sign that they were too much at odds to participate. The next day, Richards wrote that Joseph was busy with domestic concerns. Years later, in the anti-Emma atmosphere of Utah, Brigham Young spoke of a meeting where Joseph accused his wife of slipping poison into his coffee. Brigham interpreted Emma's refusal to answer as an admission of guilt. Though there probably was an argument, the poisoning accusation was unfounded. Joseph was susceptible to vomiting anyway. He had even dislocated his jaw while vomiting once before. And five weeks after the 1843 dinner episode, he was sick again, vomiting more violently than ever. During this last bout, Joseph said gratefully, my wife waited on me. So. A little different in, uh, <laughs> in content. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting getting that view but with Brigham Young, he obviously was not happy that um, Emma wasn't following him. Um, yeah. And so he, there was, there's a certain amount of having to reconcile that difference and with her being a prominent member, being uh, the prophet's wife, there had to be some sort of of reconciling that he had to do for the Utah Saints. And that's how jo uh, Brigham went about explaining the situation. But we get different accounts, and so it's up to each person to kind to, to weigh that information and decide for themselves how they think and feel about that. Yeah, and um, I also went and I... Because we know that... Um, the Lord has called Emma an elect lady. Yes. And I went and I looked up elect because I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting, elect. Um, and it says that it's choose or chosen, exaltation, heir, premortal existence, and seal. Hmm. That is what elect means. And when the Lord... In D&C 25, verse 3, he says, Behold, thy sins are forgiven thee, and thou art an elect lady, whom I have called. Yeah. Such a different feeling and contrast from <laughs> Brigham. Yeah. yeah. And so... Um, what one of one of these people is lying, and mm -hmm. you know yeah, where is the animosity coming they from? They both can't be true. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, there's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also have this quote from <clears throat> a Vienna Jax from I think she lived from 1787 to 1884. Um. I got this from Whitney Horning's book. So she's got a lot of stuff. And Whitney sources. Horning. Yeah, and a lot sources. Of information. Um, if you want to go check out her book. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's got so many, so many quotes and sources and of where she says that Joseph was not a polygamist. Like, it's awesome. But anyway, Vienna says. Well, and she was a re reputed old maid, it says, who had been with the saints in Kirtland, Nauvoo, and migrated to Salt Lake City. She had been a frequent visitor in the Smith household while in Nauvoo. In 1876, when Joseph Smith III stayed in Salt Lake during one of his missions to Utah, he was visited by several people whom he had known while living in Nauvoo as a young child. These were people who would have 
had the opportunity to know something of the life of his parents, either favor favorable or otherwise, and so he was eager to speak with them. One day, Vienna Jax came to visit and to tell him what she knew. Joseph asked her how it was that she had not married yet when she was such a warm advocate of the doctrine of polygamy. To his surprise, she became intensely sober as tears filled her eyes. And this is her, her, what she said. With trembling lips and in a hushed voice, she said, Brother Joseph, I will tell you, do you remember the lady society that was formed at Nauvoo of which your mother was president? I told her that I did, that the times and seasons had a record of it too. Well, she went on, at one of the meetings of the society, when your mother was not present, the subject of spiritual wifery came up as a matter of talk and speculation. Some said there were, there was such a doctrine as that, <coughs> as that being taught. I had always been peculiarly disposed toward marriage. I considered it to be a relation of such high, of such high and sacred character that no one should enter into it hastily, or think or speak of it in the light of an foolish manner. When those women discussed the matter and asserted that such a doctrine was being talked of, I refused to believe it, and said I would ask your mother about it. Some of them tried to persuade me not to do that, but my mind was made up, and I told them so. The next day I visited your mother at her home and had a talk with her. She told me she had asked her husband, the prophet, about the stories which were being circulated among the women concerning such a doctrine being taught, and that he had told her to tell the sisters of the society that if any man, no matter who he was, undertook, undertook to talk such stuff to them in their houses to just order him out at once, and if he did not go immediately to take the tongs or the broom and drive him out. <laughs> For the whole idea was absolutely false, and the doctrine an evil and unlawful thing. Vienna claimed that she talked to them in the society and with many of them privately, and tried her best to set them straight. I like that. <laughs> I can just picture it in my head with tongs. Yeah. Snap, snap, get up, snap, snap. <laughs> yeah. So I liked that. And um, especially when she went and talked to Emma herself. Mm -hmm. And Emma Go talked to, to Joseph. You know, yeah. like it just made me feel a little bit better. Yeah. So anyway, next. <laughs> yes, on to on the next. The next. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to now go to August 29th, <laughs> 1852. Okay. And this is the conference of um, where polygamy was came to be yes I well know, it was officially. it came to be before but well, like it was officially announced in the church in the church yeah and i wanted to kind of read some parts of it and kind of discuss it and go over some things um whatever comes to and this is eight years after joseph was killed yes and so there... this was eight years after joseph and Hiram were killed yeah, yeah. very important <laughs> yes and this is Orson Pratt, who's giving this, giving them this new law. Um, under the direction of Yeah, Brigham. under the direction of Brigham Young. All right. This is quite unexpected to me, brethren and sisters, to be called upon to address you this forenoon, and still more so to address you upon the particular subject which has been named... It is rather new ground for me, that is, I have not been in the habit of publicly speaking upon this subject, and it is rather new ground to all of the inhabitants of the United States, not only them, but to all the inhabitants of Europe, 
the greater portion of them not been in the habit of preaching the doctrine of this description. Consequently, we shall have to break up new ground. And then I, I'm going to skip a little bit. And it says, It is not as many have supposed a doctrine embraced to gratify the carnal lusts and feelings of man. That is not the ob- object of this doctrine. Mm-hmm. Curtis. <laughs> Now, if you heard about polygamy, <laughs> and if you were sitting in the congregation, like, and you heard about this doctrine, and mm-hmm. that you perhaps you'd heard about it before, life. obviously. Yeah. Well, and, and what, not only that. Is, that, is that what you think in your mind? <laughs> You're like, oh, yes, another wife, and my less, and I won't have to be, you know, going it's behind my wife's cheating. back. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting if, you know, for most of these people who were then hearing this were there to hear Joseph and Hiram talk about it. And so you can see how it is slowly broken into the congregation as Well, I think there's a, a reason it was eight, eight years after they had to, yeah, they had to deprogram yeah, them Yeah, they had first. to have time, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> there, there's some hardcore justification. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, setting up the scene. <laughs> yeah. Um, he goes on. I'm skipping a lot of this because I just kind of want to focus on some certain points. But there's also a part in here where he talks about Adam and Eve. Um, this marriage was celebrated between two immortal beings. How long until death? Know that it. No, no, that is out of question. No such thing. And in the ceremony, what would you consider my hearers if a marriage was to be celebrated between two beings not subject to death? Would you consider it celebrated and them joined together for a certain number of years than that all their covenants was to cease forever? Yeah, like that was weird. <laughs> that was just how it was written or yeah. said or written. But it's interesting that he mentions Adam and Eve for being the finest example and their men. of um, the human family and immortal, yet yeah. they are it's, monogamous. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, it, it's, it's a fallacy commonly used today where it's an appeal to authority. You look to somebody and say, well, look, they must be living this and it makes it okay. Yeah, it, to some degree, it's almost a straw man fallacy as well, because it's saying, this is what Adam and Eve did, even though we have no record or understanding that, that was the case. I don't yeah. even know how that works for Adam and Eve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was just, it's weird. Anyway, yeah. like, all the all the kind of excuses, and I don't know if they're the excuses of just him, or, like, what he was getting from the upper people, like, this is what you need to say, you know, to help... Yeah you know, bring them in. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, going on. It was the fall brought this, and consequently, when male and female was res- restored from the fall by the virtue of everlasting eternal covenant of marriage, they will continue to increase, and increasing to all ages of eternity to raise up beings after their own order and in their own likeness and image, intelligent beings germs of intelligence that are destined in their in their times and season to become not only the sons of God, but gods themselves. And I kind of put like a square over the sons and I'm like, why only sons? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because back then they didn't think about the women yeah. like that. You needed a man to be exalted, exalted with. Um, it's only t- recently that now in the temple, women covenant to God directly instead of going through their husband. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, he keeps going, do you begin to understand how these worlds get their inhabitants? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, you have to have babies. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like Orson knew that this was not going to be easily, well, at least for some people, not easily accepted. So he has to build this case Mm -hmm. slowly to get to the pinnacle of what it is that they want to talk about. 
and it's I mean, quite frankly, it's it's it is a doctrine of men mingled with scripture moment, one hundred percent. He's using scriptural evidences, scriptural stories, and he's he's slowly grooming the people listening to be ready to accept this idea of spiritual wifery. Yeah, but also know that after they brought this up, thousands and thousands of saints left. Yeah. The church. Yeah, I they think it was like, like what, 6,000 or 8,000 people left. left yeah. after well, they this. recognized it for being false doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it was hard on a lot of people. Yeah, but we're kind of getting to the end before we, <laughs> before yeah. you get to the end, but yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also wrote down in here, work. <laughs> as I was reading this, I was making notes, and I put working really hard to explain the promise of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by doing math and the sands of the sea. Yeah. And then um, we would never be able to, as mortals, populate even in one generation the seed he, he is referring to, referring to. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's more than... How many people are on the earth right now? A lot. <laughs> yeah, but it's not as much as the sands of the sea. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And in Michelle Stone's podcast, she makes it, she makes the point that monogamous couples actually have more children than polygamous couples yes. do. Yeah. Yes. Well, especially if you look, yeah, if you look at the birth rates at as soon like when this was introduced, it actually it worked better for the monogamous couples, especially because of the the difficult times that were going on. Most of the women were set off on their own in difficult circumstances. That, on average, the monogamous couples were bringing more children than the polygamous couples were. Yeah. He goes on. Why not look upon Abraham's blessings? For the Lord blessed him with innumer innumerable seed as the sand upon the seashore. So if you obey the laws, shall inherit the blessings of Abraham. How does he get along to get this mighty kingdom? Did he do it all through one wife? <laughs> and I put in the thing next to it, I put, yes, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> he did do it with one wife. Surprise. Yes. But I also want to mention that if we go back to Abraham, uh, we know that he had one wife. Um, he did not have Hagar as a wife. And... Um, she was a handmaid. Yes. She, she was, was never a elevated to the status of wife. Yes. And then... Um, and it wasn't Abraham's decision. It was Sarah's. Yes. yes. It was Sarah's decision to give him as Michelle Stone and in, in some of her recent um, podcasts she talks about how um, that pretty much back then when Sarah handed Hagar over to to Abraham that's how they did it back then surrogate. it was a surrogate yeah they couldn't do it like we do nowadays. Yeah, vitro. <laughs> In vitro and all that stuff. You had to actually do the duty yeah. to get a baby. And so that's why. Yeah, um, yeah she was standing in place of yeah. Sarah. She wasn't in addition. Yeah, yeah. So that child was supposed to be Sarah Sarah's. and Abraham's, not Hagar's and yeah. Abraham's. Yeah. Yeah. So, and obviously that turns out the way it does. <laughs> yes. Quite frankly, probably because God was, you know, they, they didn't really consult God in the process. Yeah. Yeah. God was nowhere in that decision. Yeah. You know? And you cannot, you will not be able to find any scriptural reasoning of God commanding that to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. God has never commanded anybody yeah. ever to live polygamy Yeah. in the scriptures. Yeah. And I'll, I'll also get, I'll give a shout out to Michelle too, that hopefully we are not misquoting her yeah. at all. And I don't want people to be like, well, this podcast said that you said, 
Oh, everything that we're saying that she may have said, go listen to her stuff herself. Yeah, she we're, like... We're doing our best to paraphrase, she, yeah. and it's quite possibly we're getting stuff wrong, and I definitely don't want to put words in her mouth. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. She does really good research and posts them under her podcast and everything like that, so... Yeah. And we'll have it linked in... I yeah. Know, we'll link to the channel. Yeah. But anyway, I wanted to say that we look at Abraham... And then we have Sarah, okay? And then their child, their child is Isaac, okay? And then we've got Isaac, and then we've got Rebecca, okay? Yeah. And then they have a child. Well, they have two. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, and his name is Jacob, and he's... He kind of tricked him his way into getting that, but yeah, his part. mom, his mom knew that yeah. he was the one who who was supposed to have yeah. it. And there's indications that Esau wasn't quite worthy for it. So. Yeah. So anyway, and then we have Jacob, and then we have Jacob, and Rachel. I know there's Leah in there, yeah. but Leah was. I don't know if Leah was tricked, but. But um, Jacob was definitely Jacob tricked. was definitely tricked, yeah. and that wasn't who he was going for. He wanted Rachel, yeah, like he was destined to be with Rachel. So you've got Jacob and Rachel, yeah, and then who comes out of that? Joseph, Joseph. Yeah. who eventually ends up with the birthright. Yeah, yeah, and then so on, so forth. So pretty much, it's funny each <laughs> each patriarch with the wife that he intended to have. That's the line that God chooses to continue his righteous work through. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't start with Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael. Yeah. You know, because Ishmael, it was his right because he was the firstborn to Abraham. But it wasn't the firstborn to Abraham and Sarah who were the, you know. <laughs> yeah. They were husband and wife. They were, they were, they were the OGs. And, wife. <laughs> and the only reason why she was involved was because she wanted a child and she didn't think she was going to get one. Yeah. So that was the only reason. Yeah. But obviously the Lord knew and he even told her, you will have a son, but she didn't believe him. Yeah. And so her faith was lacking in that respect. And that's how this happened. Yeah. It was almost like she's like, I need to help God make his promise or something. <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you just keep in mind those things because it came down directly through where it needed to be through the people who needed it to go through. Yeah. Um, it wasn't because they were polygamists and um, cause that is a worldly thing. Yeah. Um, Going on, one-fifth of nations of Europe done away with these promises and deprived themselves the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Another thing that Michelle says in her <laughs> last one, I think it's in her last one. She mentions that, well, no, it was in, it was in a... Uh, an interview she was giving. A Mormon yeah. interview. Yeah. An interview she was giving. And they were talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the blessings through that. Well, guess what? Isaac wasn't a polygamist. But they lump him in but there. But they lump with... him it right in the middle there. Mm -hmm. You know? And I was like, that's so true. It's like what... Isaac, I guess, was not, was not um, in the right place. You know, he needed to get those wives, but he didn't. Yeah. Because well, it, he didn't get those blessings of his father yeah. if that was true. And that's one of those things that the only thing you will find any indication of Isaac have, you know, somewhat being a polygamist is 132 and how he's lumped in with his son and his father in that category. And that's the only place it's ever mentioned. And so it's a weird, it's one of those things that, gives 132 some you should look at it a little sideways because that doesn't match up with anything else that we know about them yeah all right continuing a page or two later 
Would the Gentiles do such things nowadays? Oh no, consider that enough to send a man to endless hell of fire and brimstone. Why? Because tradition has instituted this dreadful feeling in their hearts. It matters not how corrupt they are in female portion of community, are in female portion of community, if not lawfully married to them. But it would be considered an awful thing to raise up posterity, lawful wife, wrong indeed, but to go into a whorehouse and there debauch themselves in the lowest haunts and degradation all the days of lives they consider that no harm. Sorry, there's like no periods or anything like yeah. that. It just keeps going. <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's the old timey language. Yeah. Anyway, they can license such institutions among Christian nations, and it all passes off very well. That is tradition, and their posterity have no question mark in them. They are brought up in the footsteps of wicked, wickedness, diseases, and death, as it stalks, stalks abroad among the great popular cities of the nations of Europe and America. Do you find such haunts of prostitution, degradation, and misery here in city of valley and mountains? No. Where such things in midst I should feel indignant enough to see, threat me to see them blotted out of feelings. The feelings is crossed out. Page of existence. That would be our feelings. Um... Well, such things will not be allowed in this community, and you will find that the time will come that the Lord, whose eyes are upon all the children of men, and who discerneth the things done in secret, will bring your acts to light, if such things shall exist among you, and you will be made an example before the people, and shame and infamy on your posterity, after you to the third and fourth generations, to all them that repent not." So, <laughs> let's start polygamy so that we won't have prostitutes <laughs> and you won't be finding yourself in a whorehouse. And the only people who are going to be punished and stuff by this are women. Yeah. You, the, you can hear... <laughs> It, like, he's trying, it, he's trying, he's trying, he's trying. It it falls apart when you consider it in the larger scheme of things. Like, he's trying to sell this, like, oh, there won't be any, there won't be any sexual misconduct because all these men will all have women for that to work within the system. And it's like, why does that need to be a part of the eternal covenant? If it really is what God commands, why are we bringing this up as something that needs to happen for it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's coming off, quite frankly, as a salesman mm -hmm. in the middle of General Conference trying yeah. to build you up for this. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's why it took so long for uh, probably the Section 132 to be put in the Doctrine and Covenants. Mm -hmm. See, this is... Eight years after Joseph Smith dies, Doctrine and Covenants 132 wasn't put in until 1876. Yeah, it wasn't until... Thirty-something years later. Yeah. Like... <laughs> yeah, they still... Once once this is given, it still is delayed in being like, canonized. Okay, guys, stay with me. Stay <laughs> with me. I'm still... I still got a lot of stuff to talk to you guys about. Like, yeah. this is a really long talk. I know uh, I was with a group of people where they talked about one of the, one one of the tactics of, of cult like mentalities is to overwhelm you with information, with so much information, and not allow you to address any one specific thing, but give you so much that the the weight of the entirety of it seems too much to overcome. And I feel like that is after you know having reading it through it now and also having you know, read through parts of it before, that's kind of the approach that this is going after. It's giving you all these different touch tones that look at all these different things that maybe slightly are possibly accurate, but if you try to weigh them together, they create this solidifying of this this principle to the people. It's it's a, it's a very crafty, uh, very cunning way to do it. Yeah. 
Um, several, several, several pages in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if this be the case, that the righteous are gathered out and are still being gathered from among the nations, planted by themselves, one thing is certain. If these, if these things be true, that people are the best calculated to bring up children than any other under the whole heavens, oh yes, says one. If you are the people, the ancient prophets spoken of, and you are the people guided by the Lord under influence and power guidance of Almighty must be the best people under heaven to dictate and guide a young mind. So what I put down here was saying that most of the world is corrupt and removed themselves from God. And because of this, those who are the faithful servants will have polygamy to bring offspring into the world that will not become wicked. That's what I got out of it. <laughs> and going on. Do you believe, says one, they are reserved until the last dispensation for such a noble purpose? Chosen before born like Abraham? Yes. Where the most likely place for those for these spirits to take their tabernacle through just the righteous parentage, but says one naturally be send to that people most righteous of any other people upon the earth. They're trained and up properly according to their nobility, intelligence, and according to choices the Lord made before they are born. So we're the only true church. <laughs> That's what he's saying right here, that that because we have to practice polygamy, we need to bring in these people that have made promises, and they can only come through us. Yeah. It's creating this sense of responsibility, the, this urgency of why this has to happen. Here. Yeah. He also, I'm just, it's just something I wrote here. Don't just go out and pick out all the wives you want. You need permission first. Oh, so there's a, a clause to this. <laughs> I was going to say, and I also put down here, probably because those higher up needed to see if they wanted the, wanted the women first. Mm -hmm. And he goes on, so in these days, let me announce to this congregation that there is but one man in all the world that holds keys concerning these matters. But one man has power to turn the key to inquire of the Lord and to say whether I or these, my brethren or any members of this congregation or the saints upon the face of the whole earth may have this blessing of Abraham conferred upon them. He holds the keys of these matters. And these keys belong to those that stand at the head and the front and at the front and preside over all affairs of church and the kingdom of God in the last days. It's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, I also put down here, the Lord doesn't keep salvation from anyone. If given to Joseph, he would have said it. Um... Instead of being a liar, the Lord holds no secrets. Yeah. He doesn't keep anything secret. We know that Joseph was always one that went out and shouted from the rooftops. And he got in trouble. He boldly you know, the from truth. the world, the, from men. Yeah. So why did he keep this secret for so long? Mm -hmm. Where did the key, where are the character. keys? The keys didn't get passed to Brigham or anybody. That no, because remember, Brigham was sustained by men. Yeah. In Winter's Quarter. <laughs> That's true. In Winter's Quarters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Going on, he says, "What will become of those individuals that have this law taught unto them in plainness and reject it? A voice in the stand, they will be damned." <laughs> Somebody in the stand said that. Yeah. I will tell you, they will be damned, saith the Lord God Almighty, in the revelation he has given, 
Why? Because where much given, much is required. Where there is great light and knowledge unfolded for the exaltation, glory, happiness of the sons and daughters. Of, oh, I'm glad you put daughters in there. <laughs> daughters of God. It, <clears throat> because most of the time he did not say anything about daughters. Yeah. And daughters of God. If they close up their hearts, if they reject the testimony of his word, will not give heed to the principles he has ordained. They are worthy of damnation, and the Lord has said, they shall be damned. Thus saith the word of Lord to his servant Joseph, this prophet himself, with all the honor and light he had, he must comply with it, or says the Lord, you shall be damned, and the same true in regard to all those reject these things what else we have heard from the president related to us that there is some damnations that are eternal in their nature while others after a certain period will have an end but there will not be a not there will be not a restoration but there will be a deliverance from certain punishments and instead of being restored to all the privileges <coughs> pertaining to man previous to the fall, only be permitted to enjoy a certain degree of happiness, not restoration. I put down next to it fear and threat tactics. Yep. Yeah. Um, God doesn't put fear, fear in you, no. Nope. Or threat, or threaten you. Yeah, in fact, uh, that often, you know, often the quoted scripture of fear, fear God, God, if you look at the the word that it's actually translated from, just because English is kind of an imprecise language, uh, it's closer to a respect. It still has, like, there's a fear connotation, but it, it has more to do with respect. reverence and respect, not fearing. And so anytime like, there's... Like, don't be afraid. Anytime no. there's a fear tactic that's being taught, whether it is through... Orson, you know, here across the pulpit, or from any modern day person who tries to inspire you to do something through fear, that is not of God or of Christ. Yeah. And that's really what there was in here was, and I also put like, God doesn't punish. It's those times, like I've said before, with like Job. <clears throat> God didn't wasn't like I'm gonna you know curse you and I'm gonna take everything away from you and yeah, I'm even gonna, with you yeah because of all your weaknesses Job you're you're a weak person so yeah. I don't have all these things happen to yeah. you yeah that he didn't punish him he did it for and he didn't do it I should say <clears throat> Satan came and said can I do these things yeah. to him yeah. and the Lord knew. The Lord allowed him because he yeah. knew that it would cause it would greater ascension. ascension for Job. Yeah. Yeah. So. I've got a little bit left. Let me just finish it. Um, this is towards the end of huh, this very long yeah. talk. Where are you down? <laughs> I married you in the other world before death. You are mine. Cannot do this. Why? Because never married that person for eternity. Suppose they should enter in covenant and agreement to conclude to live together to all eternity and never have it sealed by the word of Lord sealing power of the holy priesthood. Would they have claim? No, not be valid legal. And he will say it in mourning of the resurrection, not by me, your covenants, not sealed on the earth and not in heaven, not recorded on my book, not found in the records in the archives of eternity. Therefore, that blessings you might have had not for you to enjoy what be their condition. The Lord tell us, he says, that these angels because keep not this law, says he that shall be ministering servants unto those who are worthy of obtaining a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, 
Servants to them, wherefore, says he, they shall remain single and separate in their spiritual condition, and shall not have power to enlarge themselves, and thus shall they remain forever and ever. Here, then, you can read their history. They are not gods. In other words, they are angels. This is kind of where they take the plan of, is it the plan of exaltation? Where they put the... Yeah. The married people up in the celestial kingdom, but talk. then if you're not married, you're like the servants of the people. Who yeah, are. this is where the the three degrees within the three degrees kind of like this is that idea. Yeah. So anyway, it it just goes on, and he, you know, finishes, <clears throat> and pretty much outlines. And ta-da! Polygamy is officially <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> officially out there. Even yeah. though it's been there, yeah, it is now officially out. Not secret anymore. Yeah. yeah. So, polygamy is not. Of oh God. <laughs> of God. <laughs> <laughs> well, and also the the fact that Joseph and Hiram and Emma fought it, Brigham and everybody that. Eventually, everybody that followed him ended up preaching it or practicing it over time, even though there is records of some of these people being against it to begin with. They come around on it later. And I guess you could say it's it's the opinion of us here and many other people that Brigham did not have the spiritual authority to enact that as a principle of God, and it was bullying tactics from somebody who had forcibly taken control of the church after Joseph's death. Yeah. And that's also, if you remember to put that video that we watched, because it yeah. talks about how Brigham kind of... Did it himself. Um went to people in winter's quarters and kind of threatened them to vote to, for, for punishment or whatever to get him into the leadership position. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. And also I, we just want to mention that, um, Heber C. Kimball, <laughs> he wasn't a good person, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> especially to his wives. Yeah, he had a lot of them. He was kind of Brigham's right hand man. He was he yeah, was they, to like, Brigham what Hiram was to Joseph. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But on the opposite. But yeah, side not uh, not not in a good way. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't a good person, and um, we see that with how he treated his wives, and they kind of had the same personality. Him and Brigham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're yeah, um, similar dispositions. Yeah. And I I think he had forty two wives or forty seven. Something along those lines. I mean, after forty, yeah, right. stop keeping track. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I promise I've done research. I know. And yeah. on Michelle Stone, she she knows. Yeah, she knows. She did all that research, um, but she says that. Quite a few of his wives ended up divorcing, divorcing him, like most of them, mm -hmm. because of how they were treated. And, like, he didn't care. All he wanted to do was his create seed yeah. and pro posterity. Well, and, and you also know, at this, point, this because it was yeah. religiously pushed, it was a sign of spiritual, uh, how do I put this, affluence. Right, it was. It showed that he was a very righteous man to have so many wives that would put him higher up in the community. It was a prestigious thing. It was a a popularity thing. Yeah, in, and and so, that's kind of what you see in like the FLDS church and the Kingston, yeah. you know, polygamist. Yep. You know, like that's exactly what they're doing still nowadays. Like you have to have so many wives, and then. If you don't have that many wives, you're, you're not, not going to make it. To you're not going to make it to where you want to be, and then they end up threatening them or making them leave. Yeah. And oh, you have to go repent, and then they never let them back into their families, and 
Yeah. Just just how horrible it is polygamy. It breaks up families more than it does anything else. Yeah. It's just a whole bunch of heartache and heartbreak and... Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's no good to it at all. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's... That's all of it. That's all that... Uh, <laughs> so hopefully, that, I mean, this gives... Hopefully there is, through all of this, there is... You're seeing a, a, a line of the history here of how things... You know, you're seeing a different viewpoint of how things could have gone. You know, getting a little bit of a, an understanding of who Joseph was and what Joseph believed and what him and Emma believed and how Brigham didn't mind twisting things to suit his own needs and how when he firmly has control of the church here in Utah, it is opposite of what was taught by Joseph. Yeah, And I think a lot of people will be like, well... What about those women who... Who went and they, from the pulpit, they're like, this, this is, is the way to exaltation and all this stuff. Well, yes, but that's what they were taught. Yeah. By their husbands. Like, you need to be married to me. But even those ones or who won't claim be able that to they were married to Joseph Smith. I was just going to say, I think the best way I can sum this up, and I, I, I want to say my heart goes out, for all the women who were here in Utah when this happened, because in very many ways, they didn't really have much control <coughs> Not in how at all. this was. They, they were very much along for the ride. And I'm thinking specifically, I can't remember their name, it's killing me, but one mother told her child, yes, you are, Jesus. you are Joseph's daughter, you know, 100%. We have on her now, deathbed. yeah, on her deathbed, we have now been able to do DNA testing. And and she was not. not. It was 100% false. It was proven by science, by DNA sequencing. She was not And they have Joseph's not been daughter. able to prove any through DNA. And he it, has no other descendants yes. other than through And Emma. that's important to point out that, yeah, as far as we know, he had no other children other than through Emma. But I think that highlights in so many ways the problems and the heartache surrounding all this. What I'm... I'm trying to think of what this mother went through living here in Utah, you know, wh how her testimony, you know, where she started believing the Book of Mormon, was she there to see Joseph, how she went through all of these things, you know, and then she is on the deathbed lying to her child about where that child came from, you know, that that's some pretty heavy stuff. And I, I feel for both the daughter and the mother involved, and I think that describes all the women who are caught up in this the Temple Lot trial, everyone who was adamantly for uh, polygamy, everyone who testified that they were married to Joseph or they, you know, they saw people who were married to Joseph, all these things, it's so convoluted and messed up at this point because everybody's self-worth, everybody's ascension was tied to this principle thanks to Brigham Young in this area. So everyone had reasons to try to find ways to incorporate it into their life, even if they deep down did not believe it or had no attachment to it at all. And so for all of these women, uh, and it would take a lot of time and people have, are in the process of doing this. I know Michelle Stone, you know, we bring her up because she's she's not the only resources we've ever looked at, but she's a great resource because she's done so and much Whitney work. Horning and, and Whitney Horning, all these people, they've done a lot and they've looked at each of these women individually. And I think that's something that they all deserve. And Hemlock. But Hemlock did there too. is, unfortunately, there, it's just the waters are muddy and eventually each one of us is going to have to make our own decisions. But you can see where the incentives and where the pressures and where the, the cultural mores you know, the, the sense of the times could have pressured people to do things that they normally wouldn't have agreed to do or would have done. And uh, I guess my heart just kind of grieves for those women. And I hope someday we'll know for sure everything that happened. Yeah. But until then, we're left trying to piece it together with the information we have. And you also have to remember that those women's stories all come second, third, fourth hand accounts from other people who just heard and weren't actually there so how reliable yeah are they where you have your the first hand accounts from Joseph and Emma and their family 
Whereas you have the third, fourth, <laughs> yeah. fifth accounts from other people that you that's it's not reliable. Yeah. Yeah. Anymore. And I mean, we uh, come through polygamous polygamous lines. We actually are related to Joseph Bates Noble, who was supposedly. The first man to seal Joseph, seal Joseph to Fanny Alger? No. Yeah, or it was was Beeman. Some... Yeah, Beeman. Beeman. Yeah. Louisa Beeman. Yeah. So yeah. I I apologize. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> like, I don't know, like, what was going through his head for saying those things. I, well, I don't know. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, I, mean, I but think all of us. are also. I think all of us, you know, come through a polygamous line or, like. But that doesn't mean it's yeah. of God. Yeah, and yeah, it doesn't mean that it is from God. It just means yeah, that that happens. is our heritage. That yeah. is where, that's yeah. we're here now. Just because so. someone made a mistake down the line does not mean that God has given up on the rest of His children, right? And so He is going to continue, and He does. He's worked with, you know, the members of the church, despite the fact that they lived this principle, right? And things. You know, quite frankly, we're still seeing the after effects yes. of how this is affected with you know Warren Jeffs and all the FLDS stuff, all these these break off groups. We're still seeing the consequences of this being played out. Yeah. And so, yes, there's good fruit, but that's the good fruit that's there is because Christ has he's he does what he does best, which is when people turn to him, he makes it better. He turns it for their good. And when people don't, you see how it turns out for evil. Yeah. And we're still seeing it now. Yep. <clears throat> and Jose, or, and Brigham Young also said, I think it was him at the pulpit, was saying, everybody is going to be doing this. And if they don't do this in a certain time, they will be killed off and, <laughs> you know, like, we will be blessed because we're doing this. You'll see that the whole world is going to catch on <laughs> and they're going to do this. And nothing bad's going to happen to us because we're living the law. And then, like, three months later, you know, things yeah. happen and people leave. And, like, it's just never been good, yeah. even though Brigham kept saying... This is right. Yep. And so many years later, it's completely disavowed by the church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it went completely the opposite. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, that's, yeah. hopefully that's our last polygamy um, yeah. podcast. That yeah, was, I, think good. I mean, we're trying, we just wanted to get this one out just because there was so many more things that we have found through... Um, not just scripture. We kind of left the scripture one for the, the other time. time. Yeah. But this first. time we just wanted to kind of... Do everything else. Yeah. We yeah. wanted to kind of make it right for Joseph and Emma. And... Yeah. But, I mean, it's for you guys to decide. And and I we're think... not trying to say these things to change your mind or anything. It's just something that we've had the prompting to do. And to get out because we've learned it. Yeah, and quite and frankly, we've... we're tired of hiding it. We yeah. just want to be straight about how we we're feel just, about it. We're <laughs> just yeah, we're we're good in the place that we're at, and um, we're continuing to learn and be inspired by what the Lord, you know, has put in our way to help us um, return to Him, and we know that we will be able to be with our families no matter whether we're in the church or not. You know, um, we're, they're not just going to be taken away from us. Yeah. We haven't, so. yeah, and I, I think I see this a lot too where people, because we start to abandon polygamy, they abandon the concept of eternal families. That is still a belief that we hold, you know, I'm not, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth here, but we still believe that the families are eternal. Yeah. We just don't believe that polygamy and the, the idea of a bunch of women rallied around one man is the, the device to get us there. Exactly. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> That's what I was going with, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I think there's 
So we've talked about Whitney Horning and Michelle Stone, but I think another good resource would be Hemlock Knots. They have a website, Facebook group, and a YouTube channel. And they have done so many, so much research and stuff, and they even have a polygamy timeline that is very helpful. Yeah. And some of the videos that they have done explain what to look for when you're researching and, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Like, yeah. why it's better to go with first-hand accounts and instead of third and fourth and like they just go through all these things to explain like go do your own research and they help you explain yeah, they kind of how to do that research a little bit of a boot camp when it comes to researching historical events and trying to under piece together what really happened so i past. suggest you go look them up and look through their polygamy timeline and search through their videos and they have a lot of good stuff too and they go through each wife that claims to have been Joseph's wife, and basically they debunk it yeah. through first-hand accounts and what's not first-hand accounts, and it's pretty cool. But we'll have all of those listed under. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, anything you guys want to say anything here at the end? You said your piece. Here at the end of all things. Here at the end of it all things. It was a privilege. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Peter Jackson, for giving us that line. Here at the end of all things. It seems like we're <laughs> always quoting some Lord some Lord of the Rings or Marvel or <laughs> something. something. We, you know, we feed pop culture. You for guys, ourselves. not me. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda was shaking her head, so I know she doesn't. Did you have anything you want to say, Coy? Um, just you know. And we've been we're kind not, of closing yeah. softly for the last yeah. ten minutes, but just making sure you're right. <laughs> Yeah, we're just, like I said, we're just putting this out because this is just where the Lord's um, led us. Led us, and we want others to be able to make their own decisions. We're not coming to you saying you need to believe this. Yeah. Um, you need to go we and just receive. want you to see it in a different way, different light. Yeah, you need to be able to receive it in your own way, um, whether it's true or not for you. Um, because I know there's plenty of people that, that they're in a different, on a different journey than I am, you know, yeah. but we all are focused on the same thing. We're all focused in the same place as Christ and being back together with our family for eternity. And so I want to just put it out there that you need to whatever is comfortable and spirit inducing for you, um, then go with it because that's the Lord talking to you. And it's probably going to be a different journey than what your spouse or your friend or what, you know, whoever else is around you is taking. Mm -hmm. um, they have different ways of receiving their own revelation and inspiration and where they're headed. Um, sometimes it may come, come together, but like us as a family, <clears throat> we have <clears throat> people in our family that are on different journeys than us, you know, they, and we let them go. They don't have to follow what we say they don't have to listen to what we say and do in fact they don't <laughs> <laughs> it's true they, they don't. just ignore it but but they're on their own journey you know and their journey still is going to lead them back so that we can be together forever as a family yeah. and so we just want you to to ponder and receive your own way back to the lord and your eternal family and I say that, amen. 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 Um, I'm glad that's that's pretty much what I was going to say. Too. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, when this is released, by the time you guys are hearing this, the one that I've uh, would have come out the week before this, you know, I the whole podcast was talking about seeking to understand each other instead of judging each other, right? Yeah. And uh, and uh, you know, I remember. 
specifically apologizing for if I've ever disparaged anybody else's religious belief. And I understand that the nature of this is going to strike at the heart of a lot of people's uh, religious beliefs. And I, I feel like we, tr we, we tried to walk the line pretty closely of showing what we know, what we, well, I want to say what we know, what we believe and what we've seen and what we've studied and how we've gotten here without being too confrontational. And I think we tried, I think we did pretty good at that. And if anyone's listening to this and they feel super threatened <laughs> by anything we've said, go back to what Colleen said. This is, this is not meant as an attack. And I don't want anyone to feel like they are forced to, you know, that I, that we were trying to enforce on them this belief. I've we're, had, we're not your Brigham Young. <laughs> yeah, I've had good conversations with people who full heartedly believe in polygamy, uh, who believe that it will be coming back. And they've explained to me their beliefs and their, their feelings and their understandings with it. And there's a part of it that I see and I understand there, there is in, in the way that they've described it, there's, there's a beautiful nature to it. However, for me, that, that is the line between tolerance and acceptance. I'm willing to hear and listen to other people's yeah. ideas and thoughts about this. I've, I've read Brigham Young's you know, discourses, uh, multiple dis discourses about this. Um, personally, through prayer and study, I've come to believe that that is not correct, and that that uh, that viewpoint needed to be reinforced tonight with a little bit of this information. Uh, this the, it needed to have all of this information laid out, even if it wasn't perfectly pretty towards Brigham or Heber C. Kimball. And uh, if you still think that those men are wonderful, great men, awesome, continue on that. We don't, you know, that's for you to decide. Yeah. But for us, this is where we're at. And uh, we look forward to the day that Christ strips all of us of our, our traditions, our mistaken beliefs, and we're all drawn to him in love and unity. And these become non-issues through truth that he gives. And with that, uh, continue to seek his face. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.